Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, we. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. We Keith and me have 40 minutes to tell you everything about pneumococcus, which is of course impossible. So we picked some of the points we want to make. And as you can see, I'm going to talk at the basics uh, here, and uh, Keith will add some important uh, updates on, on on this. And every one of us is supposed to talk for 20 minutes, but we'll have. 30 minutes for discussion later. Um, where do I point this to get addition? Yeah, I, I press. Okay. So this is my part. And let's start with current and near future vaccines and vaccine target endpoints. So as I, you know, uh, since David talked, there is another 10 serotypes because he was mentioning 90 or oh, uh, there is over 100 now. Actually, I think 105 serotypes that have been discovered so far. And it's important because we do not have vaccine for all of them. And this is historically PCV7 who is not anymore at use. And the current vaccine in use that are mostly given in most countries is PCV13 and 10 that you know very well. We have also a new PCV10 in town from India that has 6A19A but does not have uh, three of the others here, as you can see. We have now uh, two that are uh, licensed in adults, and one is of these is licensed also in children. Uh, CREAM, uh, the 20 valent is also licensed in the States for children, but with, oh, with a three plus one uh, schedule, but not in Europe yet with a two plus one. And then they are coming in probably in the next year to four, a 21 valent for adults and additional uh, more than 20 valent serotypes. So this is not to make you remember all of this. This is just to say that doesn't matter how many serotypes you put in. It's only less, much less than half of the serotype that exists. So basically PCVs are selective vaccines. They only uh, protect you from some selective serotypes, and it's very important, as we're going to see. This is the classical ways that people like to show. They like to show what currently is covered by the 13 valent, 15 valent, etc., up to the 25 valent in Europe, in USA. But this always show you a snapshot. Once you start to vaccinate with whatever, the picture changes, and you have different uh, what has to be covered and what is covering. So the success of PCV13, for example, is that it doesn't cover much anymore because this is how you measure a success of a virus, of a, of a vaccine. Now, the, you already heard about direct and indirect consequences of administration to children, but just to remind you uh, that we are talking about several endpoints that are very important. IPD is only one endpoint, but the uh, pneumonia and otitis are much more common and sometimes even more severe than IPD. And that the, the protection against those is not exactly the same because the pathway to get this disease is not the same. And we will discuss a little bit about this. Now, remember something very important and it's not stressed enough. Pneumococcus is part of the normal flora of children. All children have pneumococci all the time. And I don't think we can live without pneumococci. So when we give a vaccine, conjugate vaccine, it's actually a vaccine against normal flora component. And that is very important because it has consequences. Now, in our flora, if you look a little bit at this, you can see that uh, pneumococcus compete with another pneumococcus. One serotype compete with the other serotype on the place in the niche of the nasopharynx. And the most successful in carriage are the ones that are found in most of the children in the entire world. So if you take one out, then the other one, the next one that is fit comes in. Very clear. So if you actually vaccinate with conjugates, the replacement in the nasopharynx is not an adverse event. It's the natural cause. You cannot get a good vaccine 
to reduce pneumococcal, pneumococcal uh, serotype that causes disease without having a replacement. So replacement is normal, it's not an abnormal event. And that is important to remember because a lot of people still talk about replacement as an adverse event. And again and again, remember this is the only vaccine at the moment that is directed against normal flora components. So we have to consider this as a different vaccine. Now we come back to this, and this is the classical way to describe colonizing in the nasopharynx and then all the types of disease. But pneumococcus really has different life. This is just one aspect of its life. It's actually a very vivid bug that can do a lot of parties and a lot of things. And if you actually look, if you look at the interaction of this bug, you have interaction with viruses, and I will come back a little bit to this, interaction with other bacteria, interaction with its own friends or foes within the pneumococcus, and of course, sometimes interaction with what we give to the children, for example, antibiotics. So pneumococcus in the nasopharynx is very complex. But in addition, uh, pneumococcus in the nasopharynx is the source for spread in the community by toddlers. And this is going to be covered by Keith, and I pros promised him always not to talk too much about it, because otherwise I have a problem with one of my best friends. So what is, the, what is the impact? Because what we really care is the impact, and you heard this morning talks that very much highlight that what really important is the impact, is not the efficacy. So the impact is important, and let's start with the IPD. It's not the most common disease, but it's the only disease that is defined by the serotype that you isolate. So at least this is microbiologically defined. So again, if you don't have good efficacy against the vaccine type, it's not going to be a good vaccine. Forget about it. But if you have high efficacy against this vaccine type, you still need reduced dosage. Uh, you get reduced dosage carriage because this goes always together. There is no good conjugate vaccine. Not in Pneumophilus, not in Pneumococcus, and not in Meningococcus. If it's a conjugate vaccine that works, it also works on the nasopharynx or oropharynx, and it reduces the vaccine type from there. So if you have a vaccine that works on those two sites, then this is how you get the impact, because the indirect protection, or what you call the herd protection, is what really protects everybody else beyond those who got the vaccine. And as David says, those who got the vaccine, the first year of life is only one year, the rest is many years. So basically, if you want to protect many, you have to give something to that child that covers the best, the nasopharyngeal carriage in terms of reduction of, uh, of, of, of this serotype from the nasopharynx and spread to others. So if you look at the impact again, you have to have efficacy or effectiveness against disease because otherwise you don't have any protection. And it depends on the endpoints. It depends on specific vaccines. But then also, uh, you have to have efficacy against carriage, as I said, and that's not the same. David talked a little bit about this, but basically what protects you against carriage is mainly the memory, the serotype specific memory B cells. So any vaccine that gives you antibodies without giving you memory B cells will not act on carriage, and you already have this from David, but I have to emphasize this. The better you have an uh, uh, immune response of the memory B cells, the better you are going to have effect on carriage. The longer it lasts, the longer you have effect on carriage. So you can measure it by antibodies one month after vaccination, but basically it's the memory B cells. So the more serotypes you have that have, and, and the more it is on, it is getting memory B cells, the better your public health will be in terms of protection. And then, of course, vaccine uptake. If you don't give it to many children, you don't get, you are not going to get a response. So the question that came before to David about why don't we give it to neonates, and David gave you some response about how the neonates and how you reach the neonates. In fact, in country that has high vaccination rate with the right vaccine and with a booster, you get a fantastic protection on the neonates 
it's in, in the order of magnitude of 90% and more in children under four months because of the indirect protection. So this is a way to protect the most vulnerable. And of course, serotype coverage is important because the more you cover in serotypes, the more serotypes you prevent them to uh, spread in your community. And, uh, and then it also, when you want to talk about the effect on carriage, it's very important when you measure this. And I don't have time to go over, but the effect on carriage is not something that is instant. It takes some time because you don't have a 90% efficacy against carriage. It's much less than that. And though you need several um, cohorts to be seeing less and less and less carriage to eventually get to the maximum uh, effect. Now, replacement, as I said, this is part, integral part of vaccination. It's not a separate part. And I just mentioned that. And this is a typical picture that comes from, uh, in this case, from our studies, but you can see it all over the world. The one thing that is good about our study is not that I want to make any promo for this, but we actually take at least 10 children per working day every single day since 2009. So instead of doing pre-post, we actually draw the curve uh, by many, many, by 365 almost points every year. And you can see the reduction of PCV13 serotypes with time in children under five. You can see how the non-vaccine serotypes are now more prevalent in children in carriage. And you can see this 85% reduction on vaccine serotypes and uh, a 45% increase in non-vaccine serotypes with almost the same overall carriage. So that is the picture that you're going to see everywhere that you vaccinate appropriately. In fact, how this, this is reflected in normal children and overall children. So this is children under five. This is in Israel. We have many years of, of nationwide study that we're doing. So it starts here in 1990, and you can see how the red, which is PCV7, goes down immediately after PCV7 introduction. Less than two years after we introduced PCV13, between the PCV7 and 13, you can see in purple, they start the increase of the PCV13, especially because of the 19A that started to, to increase uh, after PCV7. Then you can see PCV13 takes it down to almost zero, and 6A in light blue, which was partially affected also by PCV7, and then better by PCV13 is down. So you can see a dramatic and fast reduction in IPD in children in country that gave vaccine to high rates, uh, to high, high number of children with a catch-up. However, replacement is part of it. And what you see here is the non-PCV13 serotypes in yellow immediately jump up. But fortunately, most of the time they stay somewhere uh, if plus minus stable in young children. So the overall comes to a reduction, in our case in Israel, about 67% reduction and stable for many years now. So this is part of life. It's not controversial in children. Replacement does not take everything from what you gain with the, uh, with the vaccine type reduction. In addition, as I said, if you add more serotypes, you may see an additional step. You see in the upper graph how in the United States, PCV7 reduced uh, disease, and then PCV13 reduced a little bit more. You see this increase before PCV13, mainly due to 19A and some of 7F and others, but mainly 19A that went up uh, after the PCV7 introduction, but then you see a step down. If you add now 15 or 20 or whatever, we might, we hopefully will see another step down, but nothing goes down as much as the first step. So we are still having, also among the people here, countries that do not vaccinate against pneumococcal. Even now, they did not introduce PCV, so they are, they are still to see the first step. And that is very important before we go and talk about additional serotypes. You see uh, in the UK down, again, there is replacement, there is some erosion, but in children under five, you see beautiful overall reduction. Mucosal disease is the problem 
not in terms of what the vaccine does, but in terms of how we appreciate this and how we actually communicate it. Because as you all know, uh, this is the, the two, uh, the, the, all the outcomes that I showed you before, but this is the pyramid that everybody knows by heart. So the invasive disease are just a little bit in the top, about 2%, 1% of the disease caused by pneumococcus. The pneumonia is 100 times more than IPD, and otitis media is about 1,000 times more than IPD. And that's, these are actually entities that most of us, in most of the patients, don't see the serotype. We don't see even pneumococcus. We don't even know to tell you by heart how much pneumococcus is there. And before vaccination, we didn't do anything about that. So I'm not going to talk about otitis today, but pneumonia, which is the number one killer, has a pneumococcus there, which has which was a question mark before we started the vaccine. How much, which pneumonia, how to define pneumonia, and all those type of questions. And therefore, the only way to look really what is pneumococcus there, we needed to have the vaccine implemented, and then by the vaccine probe to go backwards and to see what we reduced and learn from there, what was the role of pneumococcus? And countries that wait to have local data before they introduce the vaccine, they will never get there because they don't know anything about their own pneumonias until they, uh, they vaccinate. But come on, we have to start to be more global. They can learn from others, but some places do not yet learn from others. But in the 90s, when we have meetings about how to measure what the pneumococcus will do for pneumonia, even for cases of global pneumonia that everybody agrees that these are probably, at that time we said probably must, much, much of them are pneumococcus, the question was really how much of this is pneumococcus? And then the non-consolidated pneumonia, we knew that pneumococcus is there, even LRI without any sign of pneumonia, but how much, that was a, type, a real question. And why? We did not know what proportion is pneumococcal? We did not know of, of pneumococci, what proportion is vaccine type? We did not know what the efficacy of PCV is against vaccine type pneumococci in pneumonia. We did not know what the extent of replacement in pneumonia. We did not know, uh, uh, how, we didn't know even at that time how much the extent of, uh, of, of, of reduction in carriage will be. So if there is 100% reduction in cavage, it's fantastic because you will not see any more much of the pneumococcus or vaccine type, so you almost get 100% protection against vaccine type pneumonia if you vaccinate everybody. But all those questions were not at that time answered. And then which vaccine we measure, the 10, the 7 valent, 13 valent, etc., to know. So basically, everything is a question mark. And then how long after introduction of the vaccine we will see something? So basically, we didn't know anything. We didn't even know how to define pneumonia. At least this lobo pneumonia was an endpoint pneumonia that was agreed because the kappa between readers is about not too bad. So this is what we learned from the vaccine probe. For example, in children, we have a prospective study in our uh, institution where we have one hospital where everybody is born, 17,000 every year, and they are hospitalized in the same hospital, only one emergency room, so we can actually measure how many come with uh, low respiratory infection that have lobo pneumonia in their, in their uh, x-ray. We read every single day all the x-rays by three readers. If I'm here, it means that I have to read more x-rays when I come back, but we read all the x-rays since 2002. So that is many, as you can see. You can see the rates. The rates here are measured by thousand per thousand, not per hundred thousand. So again, it's like hundred times more common. And you look at the cases here. We're talking about children under five here is in the order of magnitude of 14 per thousand. So it's 1400 per 100,000 versus 50 or 40 per 100,000 of IPD. So pneumonia is really very, very common. And when you actually look, and this is only low pneumonia coming to the hospital. And if you actually look what happened after PCV-13, you see this very impressive immediate reduction of 50%, which is a huge reduction of disease. And that is 
not only in Israel. This is a beautiful slide, and this is mine, so I'm very proud. But you can see it in many places, exactly the same picture in Loba and Ammonia. Not only this. Ah, by the way, if, if this is happening, then you go backwards and you say, if I could do with PCB13 50% reduction, so at least 50% of the pneumonias were of vaccine serotype of PCB13. Let's say that we did not vaccinate everybody. Let's say it's not 100%. So maybe even more than 50%, which means that at least 75% of lobo pneumonias are pneumococcal. So lobo pneumonia is a pneumococcal disease, and that's very important to remember. But what about, no, I just changed the, the scale. So the red is what you saw in yellow before. All the others are children coming to emergency room because they have LRI, any LRI that needed an x-ray. So severe enough to have an x-ray. Most of them without any finding an x-ray. And when I say any finding, any infiltrates. Okay? And when you look at this, you find out that PCV13 reduced 35%, 34% the children needing x-ray. And that is x-ray without any infiltrates, which means that most, that the, the third of the children coming with LRI to emergency room have pneumococcal vaccine serotype there, okay? And that's, again, if you go backwards, at least 50% will have pneumococcus involved in that. So any LRI that is serious enough has a chance to be pneumococcus on, uh, 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 and many of these pneumococcus vaccine types. So this is how much pneumococcus is involved in LRIs in young children, and this is how much impact you can get with pneumococcal conjugate vaccines. Now, it's not only us. I just brought a few examples. So here, this is in, uh, I think, in Mozambique. And you can see in Mozambique, a 75% reduction in IPD and a 44% reduction in radiologically confirmed pneumonia. Very similar to what we have in Israel. <laughs> you can see this is from Kenya. You can see, again, the 50% reduction in radiologically defined pneumonia and clinically defined severe, very severe pneumonia, which is all type of LRIs. <laughs> again, the same type of reduction of 27% in this case. In the UK, if you look at the upper graph, IPD by red, you have 70% reduction within a few years after PCV10, PCV13. You see that the pneumococcal pneumonia, which is the pneumonia from which you isolated pneumococcus in children, is going the same way, exactly. But the scale, you look at the Y axis, and this is like a few numbers. If you look at the lower graph, you see the same IPD as before, but now in green, you see all type of LRIs or all type of what they call pneumonia, and it's much more common. Now you see the reduction for only 30%, as I showed you before, but look now at the y-axis and compare it to the pneumococcal pneumonia. So basically, LRI is very common. Impact on LRI is huge of vaccine, and that is the most important impact in pneumococcal disease. This is the same idea from Australia. Now, we had sort of potentially surprised, I'm not sure that everybody was surprised, but most of the people were, when Keith and Shabir, when they did the PCV9 study in uh, South Africa, they also uh, looked at all the cases from which they took viruses of pneumonia, and which was which were called until that time, or even now, by many people, viral pneumonia, because it's pneumonia and it has a virus. So they were called viral pneumonias, and they showed in red the percent reduction of <coughs> children that received PCV9 versus placebo of viral pneumonias, which is no way to explain otherwise than co-infection with the virus. So you reduce the pneumococcus, you reduce the virus. And that's very clear. However, the question that still remained and nobody talked about it is, is it really because, well, is it because there is something that pneumococcus does to the virus or the virus does to pneumococcus? Or is it because just because you reduce the number of pneumococcal cases, that means of pneumonias, you have less chance to take the virus tests and therefore you have less viruses. So the co-infection is there, but the real interaction is not proven until you actually take the virus and you see whether then the pneumococcus is reduced. And this is actually coming. Now I'm finished. This is my, my best. Okay. Two people come to me. Okay. 
And what you can see here, what you can see here is what we learned from the COVID. We learned from the COVID that the viruses, especially RS virus, but some other viruses in, in the lower part, they, if you look at their epidemiology and you look at the pneumonia epidemiology, this is the lobar pneumonia epidemiology, you see the similarity. You have a new paper that we published about the model. And basically, God did the study for us, reduced the viruses. At the same time, the pneumococcal associated disease were reduced. And this was proven that actually the interaction is real and that a reduction of viruses brings reduction of pneumococcal disease. And you can see here in orange how much RS virus, for example, is playing a role in alveolar pneumonia and this is thousand of cases. We, the new thing is now that this is not yet published, this is just we're working on it. You saw the reduction of 50% of, IPD, of, of alveolar pneumonia, but we also could look at the rates of RS virus within this, and you have the same reduction of 50% in RS virus pneumonia, which tells you very well that now we have the two sides. And this is my last point, is that when you look at pneumonia, the PCV reduced by 50% the pneumonia, the reduction of the viruses during COVID reduced further the pneumonia, the coming back of the viruses brought it back to what it is. So now we know exactly that PCVs reduce RS virus hospitalization, RS virus reduction reduces also pneumonia. So that's probably something in the future to be the next successful antinomococcal vaccination by reducing RS virus. So we have to think about uh, the next steps because we cannot con continue to have too much serotypes in. So these were the basics that I gave you very, very fast and not fast enough because I stole one minute. And now Keith is coming to tell you about his stuff. Well, I couldn't wish for a better person to give the intro than Ron. So even though we're shown strategically kind of arguing with each other, uh, that was a wonderful presentation, Ron. And so now I want to talk to you about this super cool stuff. So if you're in uh, infectious diseases and if you're interested in pneumococcal disease, we had the first vaccine in 2000. We had the second vaccine, PCV13, around 2010. And now in 2023, there are a whole lot of vaccines coming. You saw some of them. And that is extraordinarily exciting because – as you saw from all the data that's been shared with you, these vaccines are unique. They impact on the normal flora. We're going to learn a whole lot about pneumococcal disease. We're going to learn a whole lot about interaction with viruses based on what the new vaccines now are going to do. So the field is super excited, and we're going to hopefully excite you guys about it too. So before we get there, I want to take a step back because I don't know how much has been talked about pneumonia in this forum. But pneumonia, I mean, we've just had a pandemic of pneumonia, right, with enormous mortality in the elderly. And this is pre-pandemic. And what it's showing you is really fascinating data. So from the year 2000, through this is 2000 to 2019, there's almost like a miracle in children, okay? There's been a dramatic reduction in pneumonia mortality in children. It's not talked about that much. What drove this? I wish I could say it was all pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. In fact, much of what drove that is people, parents of very poor children coming out of absolute poverty in places like China and India, and to some extent in Africa, but perhaps not as much. So there's been this dramatic reduction in pneumonia mortality in kids, but look what's happening in adults, okay? And so this is actually, we're a victim of our own success as we get more and more elderly now, and elderly means anybody older than me, not necessarily older than Ron. But if you're over 70, uh, the number of over 70s is doubling on this planet every 10 years, and they are going to die of pneumonia. Pneumonia is exponential above age 70. And while COVID taught that lesson to many of us, those of us in the pneumonia field knew that pneumococcus does exactly the same thing and flu does exactly the same thing and RSV does the same thing. As you get old above age 70, there's an exponential risk of your mortality from, uh, from pneumonia. And therefore, 
The fraction of individuals who die of pneumococcal disease differs uh, on the planet, sub-Saharan Africa on the, on the left. The green is mortality in children. So although pneumococcal pneumonia has gone down dramatically in sub-Saharan Africa, it's still a big deal, South Asia. You can also see the, the, the green section. If you come here to Europe, who dies of pneumonia? It's the elderly, okay? And so if you have a vaccine where you can vaccinate kids, stop transmission, and protect the elderly, that is a huge deal, and that will give you a lot of value uh, for your vaccine. So what is the most, this shouldn't surprise you guys, what is the vaccine that has the most potential to save lives on the planet? And this is pediatric lives, and I'm delighted that we can put malaria in here. You will have a malaria vaccine uh, talk later this week. We never had a malaria vaccine. It's it's not great. It, uh, it's just starting to be introduced, and there's enormous burden of malaria could be prevented, but pneumococcus is still number one. Now, you've seen a number of these slides, but I think it bears repetition. This is the original vaccine that rolled out in the United States in kids, and you've seen Ron just show data like this. Uh, um, you saw data uh, earlier uh, also from other countries and this is what you hope to see. So you introduce in 2000, these are the vaccine types, and they disappear. But this is only the second coolest slide that I'm going to show. The coolest is the next one, because nobody on this slide got pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. This is the same country, America. It's the same time period. These are the vaccine types at the top here in red, but now causing disease in adults over age 65. None of those adults were vaccinated, and this is what happened to the disease. 92% reduction. You cannot get 92% reduction of disease by vaccinating adults. Okay, You can't get to 92% of adults. The highest rates of adult immunization virtually anywhere on the planet are less than that. A few places might have got close with COVID in the, in the middle of a pandemic. And that 92% is now down close to 100% for PCV7. Now, PCV13, I could have showed you the same data from uh, the U.S., but I'm switching to Africa and showing you here, this is the incidence of serotype 1. It's the largest serotype causing invasive disease in Africa, and this is in South Africa, and this is, again, the introduction of PCV13, because that included serotype 1. Again, we're looking at adults. Well, they're defined as everybody over age 5, so it's H5 up, most of the invasive pneumococcal disease in South Africa, interestingly, is not in the elderly because there are not so many elderly. It's in HIV-infected adults. But serotype 1, if you look at these bars, has disappeared. Okay? So a disease that was predominant among HIV-infected adults has disappeared by vaccinating kids uh, in South Africa. And that's, that's super cool. Now, I'm not going to dwell on adult immunization. But these data at the bottom suggest that there has not been similar impact of adult immunization. So this slide only goes up to 2017. You'll have to believe me that up to 2019, before the pandemic, it looks exactly the same. So here's the reduction in disease. What we're looking at here is adults over age 65. PCV13 is introduced for kids over here in 2010. The adult disease starts going down, and then it's introduced for adults and essentially no impact. So that doesn't mean it doesn't work in an individual, but it certainly has not impacted the overall incidence of disease. So in my view, pneumococcal conjugate vaccines should be given to infants, and by that, by giving them to infants, you interrupt transmission and you protect the adults and the elderly. And as Ron pointed out a moment ago, you also protect the unimmunized, very young kids, those too young to be immunized. Now, the next, the middle part of my talk, I'm going to talk about schedules. So Australia was interesting in that Australia had a lot of early disease in Aboriginal communities, and they decided they wanted to allocate the three doses that they wanted to give all to the first three doses in the EPI schedule, so two, four, six months in Australia, and they didn't give a booster. And unfortunately, eventually they discovered that the effectiveness of the vaccine post-PCV7, this is up to 12 months after the last dose. Now, the last dose was at six months of age. So by 18 months of age, 
They had great protection, 89% protection. A year later, it's down to 74, then it's 40% and basically non-significant. So protection only really lasted for two years after PCV7. PCV13, exactly the same story. Within a year, 87% protection of kids. This is from invasive disease, uh, drops to 69, and then all gone uh, thereafter. So for maintenance of protection for invasive disease, give a booster. You wouldn't think that's so complicated. Took the Australians a lot of time to learn it, but eventually they did, and they introduced a booster. Now, what is happening with PCV? This is the picture of an unequal world not so long ago, 2006. These are the countries that got this life-saving vaccine. And you'll see it was Australia. For some reason, the New Zealanders hadn't even got there yet. Most of Europe, North America, Canada. So great for those places, but the very places where kids never die or very seldom die of pneumonia uh, had the vaccine. Now, the top graph here is really stunning, and I can say that for the first time, we're actually looking at an end game for PCV because most of the world is green. There, there's something called a middle-income gap where there are a couple of countries, often with political conflict or war, so Venezuela, Egypt. Uh, there's problems, obviously, in Iran, in Syria, uh, countries that don't have the vaccine yet. And and that's kind of really sad. But there are opportunities and the costs are coming down and hopefully um, that can be improved. There's So we're not done yet. There are still countries where more than a million kids remain uh, unimmunized, uh, Gavi countries or, in fact, global countries. I was chatting to someone from Iran at lunchtime and he said they've got a birth cohort of 1.1 million and no kids get pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. So we're close, but not done yet with introductions. So the problem is cost. This vaccine is the most costly vaccine that Gavi has distributed, with the exception now most recently of the COVID vaccines. So what could you do? Well, if you do interrupt transmission and if the serotypes go away through herd protection and carriage, do you really need three doses? And the answer is you may not need three doses. So two doses may be sufficient. In fact, the UK now only gives two doses, and that reduces your cost of vaccine to poor countries, potentially by a third. So we at the Gates Foundation have been funding such studies. These are data from um, uh, Vietnam. And what they show, this is looking at uh, carriage here and showing that no doses, because Vietnam is, again, one of the places that hasn't introduced this is the carriage, and then a one plus one schedule, so just two doses, uh, reduces carriage in the interests of time. I'm going to show you this further study. This is a really elegant study. It's not published yet, but they were very kind to share the data with me. This is, you learned this morning about the benefit of a cluster randomized study. So this is in a place called Nha Trang, which is a, uh, a lovely little village on the coast in Vietnam. No immunization for PCV yet in Vietnam. So the study was designed was to randomize the uh, sections of this town uh, into uh, five different groups. And uh, essentially one of the groups, one of the, some of the areas got two plus one, so two vaccines uh, early on and then a booster at, uh, at nine months of age or nine months to a year. One got three doses early on. This group got the one plus one that I was just talking about. There was even a group that just got one dose given to toddlers. And then surrounding this whole area is a control region where there's no vaccine at all. And at the end of the day, by 2019, the carriage rate of vaccine type pneumococci in the control group was 12.8%. And all of these other strategies worked. So for carriage, it seems that even the three plus zero works quite well. So because carriage, as you've heard, is probably mediated by induction of B-cell memory, um, it does seem that even the 3 plus 0 induces good protection from carriage. It doesn't protect as long against invasive disease as I just showed. So that's an argument for, for the booster. Now, to finish, I want to talk about the future with all these cool new vaccines coming. 
Um, and so this is just to uh, to give you a broad picture of the diversity of serotypes that are out there. Um, I don't have a slide to show you, but there's a fascinating study across Africa called CHAMPS, which is looking at mortality in children. Uh, and still, the pneumococcus is number one cause of pneumonia mortality in children, even though the vaccine has rolled out. So as successful as PCV13 has been, there's still a lot of pneumococcal disease out there. Okay, so this is the slide you probably dreaded, which is a picture of all those new vaccines that are, are, are coming along the line and showing you all the extra serotypes. But there are a few things that I just want to point out. So the first is, in kids, the only one of these so far that is licensed uh, and recommended for use is the 15-valent, which is basically the 13-valent with these two serotypes, 22F and 33F. They were important uh, when Merck started making this vaccine, which was many, many years ago, uh, but they're not key for uh, kids in developing countries. So they're not major serotypes as far as we're concerned at the Gates Foundation. So in our mind, we put the 15 valent with the 10 and 13 as a sort of second generation. And then all these 20 plus are, are pretty exciting. So there are a bunch of new serotypes there. I'm afraid that most of these products, these four over here, were all designed for adults. So the, they're the additional serotypes that cause invasive disease in adults in the United States. Why? Why do you think in the United States, because that's where the money is, okay? So the, the vaccine is going to be the new vaccine. I don't know what it'll be, but it's going to probably be north of $200 a dose, a lot of money to be made by vaccinating a huge cohort of adults in the United States. So there on, there's only one vaccine on this list, which is the bottom one, which is designed for children in developing countries. Now, that's not to say that these vaccines will not be beneficial in kids. These serotypes do cause disease in kids. But the, the system is, in my view, not ideal. In other words, we're not focusing primarily on vaccinating kids, which will protect against adults. There is money to be made by vaccinating adults, and it may reduce disease in some adults, and it's very important in some immunocompromised adults. But by and large, if you want to protect all adults, immunocompromised and not, in my view, you should be vaccinating kids. Now, eventually, these products are going to get to kids. And when they do get to kids, I think they're going to have a big impact. So the last thing I want to talk about is the newest vaccine, which is uh, already been approved in principle by the FDA, uh, but not yet used and not licensed in kids. And so we're going to look at how it was licensed because there is an important issue here. So there's a couple of ways that the FDA had to make a decision. And the top one here, these are the, what they call the co-primary endpoints, the, the endpoints which were used for licensure. And the first, it's a lot of words, non-inferiority of the percentage of participants with IgG above predefined levels. Okay, bloody bloody blah. What that says is that we have a level of protection. And in general, it's 0.35 micrograms per mil. But the, so they're looking for the percentage of individuals, children in this case, who uh, who at least got 0.35 micrograms per mil. Now, there's some subtleties to this. They didn't use 0.35 for all of the serotypes, but the um, it was non-inferior if there was more than a 10% reduction uh, in, in that. So what we're doing here, I'm not making myself entirely clear, is we're comparing PCV20 to PCV13, and we'll see that non-inferiority was met for 14 types. So here is the 10% line. The started line means that PCV20 is 10. The, the number of kids who reached 0.35 micrograms per mole was 10% less. Okay. And there are six, one, two, three, four, five, six that didn't meet that. So it met it in 14 out of 20. Well, that's okay, but it's not great. And in fact, wouldn't immediately lead to licensure. So non-inferiority was not met for six serotypes. But there were two other endpoints. One was non-inferiority of the amount of antibody, the geometric mean concentration after the infant series, and this looks rather better, doesn't it? So non -in they're all above the non-inferiority line, but where is it? The non-inferiority line is at 50%. So in other words, you're only inferior if you're 50% or less 
uh, of the response in the PCV13. So all 20 vaccine serotypes met non-inferiority, but there's the line of equivalence. So there's been a tremendous immunological hit by going from 13 to 20 serotypes. You'll see that all of these serotypes are less immunogenic. They're not 50% less immunogenic, but they are less immunogenic. So it is lower for all serotypes. And then and for 12F, I said that's the one of the new ones. Okay, what's the third? The last one is after the toddler dose, so after the booster. Again, data look great. Nothing is non-inferior. Everything is above. But there's the line of equivalence, okay? So there's been a big price paid. Now, I'm still confident that this vaccine will protect kids. Why? Because PCV13 was actually more immunogenic than PCV10, which was widely used and was shown in randomized trials to be protective. This is more along the line of the immunogenicity of PCV10. What worries me is that in the future, when this vaccine is licensed, the next generation of vaccines are going to compare themselves to this one. And so they can go even lower. And at some point, we might reach a point where we can't be confident that there will be protection. Okay, this is just to show you PCV15 very briefly. Uh, you do get a slight increase in uh, response to uh, serotype 3, which is a problematic serotype, but it's still the lowest serotype, so not much uh, extra there. This is uh, another exciting vaccine. It's not yet been no data in kids. Uh, it's a, another approach to making the conjugates. So the hope is maybe you could make conjugates which don't have this drop in immunogenicity. Uh, and then finally, this is the invent prize that I mentioned. Again, it'll cover more serotypes. You saw that from Ron. Uh, but it also may be more immunogenic because it has a change in the way that the conjugation is done with the linker. But again, we have no data uh, in infants. So in summary then, deaths are declining in children. Great news. But pneumonia remains a major killer of children and adults. PCV is rolled out in many low- and middle-income countries where it's reduced mortality. Uh, and there, we've talked a little bit about the replacement. I didn't go into detail. Uh, and it's also of concern to me that it's not in all countries. Herd protection is key, and a booster dose may play a useful role. But essentially, in my view, PCV should roll out in kids. The end game for PCV may be a 20-plus vaccine. We'll see how far we can go. And innovation in dosing schedules, such as just two doses, may be a way to make it more affordable for poor countries. So with that, question time. Thank you. It's just, uh, I, think, I don't think you were 100% clear. Uh, the 50% for the non-inferiority is not the GMT or GMC. It is the lower... Bound of limit the of the confidence interval. So yes. they did not go down close to nine to 50%. They were much higher than 50%. But when you but, look at the confidence interval, the lower limit has to be yeah. above 50%. But I mean, having said that, they were not much higher. They were all lower. But, uh, and I agree, Ron is right. It's the lower bound of the confidence interval. So if your point estimate is 50%, you're gone. So you need a point estimate of at least 60%, 70%, which, interestingly enough, was where virtually all of them lie. Uh, and so you have to be confident that it's above 50%. So that is a little bit better than a cutoff of 50%. Question. Who said the brightest people are in the front row? I don't know who said that. Um, but I'm Catherine. Thank you so much for this talk. Um, my question has kind of two parts, but they're related. The first is that... Um, given zero replacement, to what extent is there any concern about a new serotype that hadn't previously been problematic causing a lot of severe disease and death? And related to that, can you explain what you mean by the end game with zero replacement as a common issue? So I think we know what we know. We don't know what we don't know. Okay. So um, we know much about the invasiveness of serotypes, about their um, biology. And we can sort of predict with quite a bit of success most of the serotypes. Having said that, we always, when we introduce a new vaccine, we have some surprises. Okay? So, for example, the last surprise is 24F, which came in France and Spain. Totally unexpected to be so successful. Because in order to be 
successful in causing disease, you have to be invasive and being able to be carried and spread. And 24F was not so much able to be carried and spread and sort of adapted. So you have surprises. So far, when we go from 7 to 10, 10 to 13, you do see a step down with replacement. We don't know anything about efficacy of the extended serotypes because it's done by non-inferiority. We hope the efficacy as a group will be as good as the others. We hope that overall what is left as a group will be less invasive than what we take away. And it seems very logical. So we have quite a bit of feeling that it's going to be better than where we are now. But as I said in my talk, first time you give a vaccine, this is the biggest step. All the others are smaller and you get a reduced benefit every time you go ahead. And we don't know exactly the dynamics in the future. So the answer to your second question then is the end game. And it's just related to exactly what Ron said. So there's 100 plus serotypes in the beginning. The only reason we had really an effective vaccine is the types in the vaccine were causing a lot more disease than the types that were not in the vaccine. Now, the incremental value of adding a, vac a vaccine type, say, above 25 or 30, is going to be tiny. It'll be maybe 1%. And unfortunately, the replacement strains will not be much less virulent. So you could eventually come to a situation where, yes, you're adding some, but you're, you're probably replacing at a relatively similar rate. So that's why I think we may be approaching the end game of this serotype-specific approach to pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. But this, again, it's important because we didn't emphasize it in the talk. What is not invasive in children doesn't mean necessarily that it's not invasive in the elderly. And some of the replacement in children are causing much disease in the elderly, and Keith has alluded to it, but having pneumonia, which is increasing uh, in adult beyond. Therefore, the new potential vaccines for adults that contain serotypes that are not in children, but increasing because of replacement, may be a complementary approach to save the adults from the replacement of, of children better than just giving to everybody 20,000 serotypes. Question over okay. here. Tons of questions. Uh, thank you. Um, I was uh, quite uh, surprised that you didn't present the uh, data regarding the antibiotic resistance since uh, the implementation of a vaccine should reduce the incidence and then the antibiotic consumption. Mm -hmm. What's about that? Yes. And we have, we have time in the, third, in the third <laughs> hour of our talk. We can add that. We had to cut, we had to cut resistance, otitis, and many other issues because good we were given 40 minutes. But good point. The, there's plenty of evidence. Uh, Ramanan uh, alluded to it in his talk. There's abundant evidence from many uh, randomized trials of pneumococcal conjugate vaccine and observational data uh, that antibiotic-resistant pneumococci go down in fact, they were preferentially included in the PCV7 and 13 types. Most of them are resistant. And it is a factor in which serotypes you want to add to the vaccine. You want to add the resistant strains because their resistance gives them an ecological advantage in a world full of antibodies. Actually, the story is much sadder than that. Because what you have, you have a replacement. You, the way you get resistance is how long you stay in the nasopharynx, how much you're exposed to antibiotics, and how much you're transmitted. So you have less disease, but in fact, and then less resistance at the beginning, but then you get in, in resistance that increases in all vaccine type. So actually, the overall resistance did not change much. The incidence of resistance reduced. The overall did not. And after new replacement, it will be the same, because we don't do our jobs of reducing antibiotic use. I think right there. Okay, thank you. My question is, uh, uh, there is a slide you presented on uh, efficacy of the pneumococcal vaccines when you look at the different uh, uh, schedules, like when you use one dose, two dose, or three dose in terms of efficacy against uh, pneumococcal carriage. So my question is, uh, do you have information to know, like, depending on how many doses you have used, like, how long does the immune protection against a carriage persist? 
So that's a really good question. And for that randomized trial, uh, we continued to fund the trial. Originally, it was only going to go to two years of age. And then we funded them up to three. And then we funded them up to four. And part of the reason we did that was a study that Ron is actually a co-author on, which showed that it may be the three to four-year-olds that are the most important transmitters to the elderly. Um, but so far, the data from that study suggests uh, that the protection does last at least through that age. Now, this surprised us because we thought the booster would probably be essential uh, for that longer duration of protection. So in that one study, which at the moment is the only real uh, large study randomizing different groups, um, it does seem that you induce quite good memory against uh, uh, carriage, which uh, which continues to afford protection against carriage at least for, for two more years. This is very preliminary, I would say, because, yes, you do get exactly the same effect on carriage with one plus one after you get the, sec- the, the booster, but you don't know exactly the duration of memory. And Australia, as you said, took seven years before they found out that with a three plus zero, you don't have a memory that is as long as with a booster later on. Well, that so was I protection. think we need a little bit yeah. more time. Yeah. For that. I mean, that was, we certainly, that the protection against invasive disease wanes, and I think that that's quite clear. And so for serotypes like serotype 1, we're certainly seeing much more serotype 1 in Africa without the booster than in South Africa where they did include the booster. So I, I actually agree with Ron. I think it's early days. Uh, I think in general the argument for the booster is there, uh, but at the moment it's only clearly for protection against invasive disease. We, we haven't been able to make the argument on, on carriage yet. So, oh, lots of questions. Let's do Mira and then a new voice here and then third from third from the right who hasn't asked a question in a while. So, Mira, start. Um, thank you for that talk. In uh, Kate, one of your, I think early on in your um, graphs, you showed a plateauing rate in adults. Was that correct? And was, yeah. so what? I guess my question is, what will it take to bring that incidence down, and do we need to bring that incidence? So the coverage of adults in the U.S. got up to about 65% uh, over the age of 65, um, and uh, with the conjugate vaccine, the 13 valent. But they're giving exactly the same vaccine to infants, and we could see no incremental benefit beyond what had been seen by vaccinating the infants. Uh, It will be an interesting story because after 2019 what happened the pandemic and so all invasive disease dropped so you could say well maybe it was a late response but it wasn't it was the pandemic and now the numbers are back up so the cdc surveillance continues and it's going to be fascinating because pcv20 is now licensed in adults so we'll wait and see whether just vaccinating maybe up to 65 percent of adults alone does anything to the total number of invasive, do you expect it to have some impact? Uh, but again, once it gets introdu- introduced in infants, that's when I would expect we'll see the big impact on those serotypes in adults. So there was a question right there, yeah. All right, thank you very much. Um, I think the immunogenicity study data that you showed, uh, which compared the high valency uh, vaccines to the existing ones, I think they are from high-income countries. Yes, that's from the US. I was wondering if you do yeah. have data from low middle income countries. So we don't. The, um, they may exist, but not. I haven't seen them in the public domain. We may have someone from the company here who can talk about what data exist on PCV20 in children in low middle income countries. Well, the, the, the experience, though, is that conjugate vaccines, Haemophilus or pneumococcus, in the previous studies, whenever they were studied in developing countries, the antibody response, if anything, was higher than in developed countries. That's true. So Africa, Asia, etc., Philippines was higher. Where I don't recall studies where the conjugate response, to, the response of conjugate was lower in yeah. developing countries. Sure. About efficacy, that's a different thing because you may get a higher load sure. of bacteria. But we haven't seen any data yet. And the way I did, because I'm trying to encourage 
some data because obviously you're not going to get a license in many places unless you have some local data. There's a person over here, yes. So talking about um, boosters and affordable schedules, what's your view on the um, PCV followed by the polysaccharide vaccine? Don't like it. <laughs> so, uh, so there's quite a lot of interesting data, and some of it was alluded to by David, that the polysaccharide actually, while it gives you a short-term boost in antibodies, does not induce memory and may actually deplete your memory B cell response. So in the current environment, while there is a recommendation, say in the U.S., for adults to get a 15 followed by a 23-valent polysaccharide, I think, in my view, that the 20-valent, uh, which is very, very close in its coverage, you know, the missing serotypes are not major serotypes. So the 20-valent conjugate alone, in my view, from an immunologic point of view, is a better vaccine for adults over 65. And seeing as I am an adult over 65, I went that route and I have not had the polysaccharide. In fact, all recommendations of PCVs followed by PPVs, all of them are not based on any evidence that shows any advantage of this schedule, but there are some evidence to show disadvantage of this schedule by reducing memory B cell and actually eating a little bit on the success of the, in the common serotype of the conjugate vaccine. So I'm very happy to see that at least we start to have some conjugates with enough serotypes to make potentially PPV go away. Good, we still have time. So there's a question here and then Mateus, you're next and then down in the row over there. Okay. Thank you for the great presentation. So my question is regarding the competing um, replacement process. Um, as, as you um, presented, I know that that's normal, but is there data between, um, is there any difference between in the replacement process between those who receive um, the PCV vaccine and those who were not vaccinated against? And in the context of Africa, knowing that there is not much um, as a follow-up question from someone there regarding the AMR, there is not much structure in terms of AMR surveillance with all these um multivalent vaccines. How are you? Re replacement is only occurring when you take something and something else come in. If you don't vaccinate, you don't take anything. I... So in fact, the vaccine, the less the vaccine yeah. is successful, the less your replacement is. Yes, that, that's what I'm saying. So with these multiple vaccines that I know the, the efficacy is probably better, but with these multiple vaccines that are in, in the pipeline, are you also thinking about how this replacement yeah. process. So might... there's a, there, there are models which are more complex than my mind can get around, but certainly there's at least one paper in a very prestigious journal making the argument exactly what you said, that as you increase the number of vaccine types in your vaccine, you would expect replacement to become more of a problem. That's sort of what I tried to allude to earlier. So, yeah, I think we may reach a point at which we are not going to get much benefit from taking further strains out of the nasopharynx. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a controversial area. I mean, it's interesting. There's serotype 11A, this may be too much information, but that is a serotype that is very commonly carried in children. In fact, it's, it's one of the most commonly carried serotypes. And when you work out the index of invasiveness in children, so it's very commonly carried and it's one of the least likely to cause invasive disease. Now, because it's so commonly carried, you find it in invasive disease, but it's sort of way down the list in children. You could argue that's not a great vaccine type to put in a vaccine for kids because you're going to take out a commonly carried strain that is very rarely invasive in kids, and you're going to replace it with something else. Now, it is true. In Korea, it's number one now. Yeah. Okay. In so, PD in children. Okay. So, so. You know, it could vary, and predicting the world is is tricky. But there, there there may be an argument for trying to select strains that are more invasive rather than more carried. Yeah, but 
I think for your question, there is another issue which I tried to say, but in, in my 20 minutes, pneumococcus is part of the normal flora. Now, we didn't discuss at all, but vaccination changed the microbiome. Even PCV7 changed the microbiome. Post-PCV13, there is more hemophilus. There are different serotypes that go much easier into biofilm and others. So basically, how far can you change the microbiome of children? Because that one, before that one up will punish us. So the point is, we do not want to get to the point where we do harm. And we don't know whether we are now getting to the border or not. We only will know when we get there. So it's not easy to predict. And we hope not to get to that point. I have a question about China. I expect that the reason why they haven't introduced is because often they prefer locally produced products. So I'm wondering whether, A, are there any activities in vaccine development in China for NEMO, or B, whether we have some structured conversations with China to convince them to produce uh, vaccines manufactured elsewhere? Yeah, so it all comes down to incentives. Uh, there is a manufacturer in China. There's one licensed product in China. It is very expensive, and it is designed for the private market in China. Uh, there's no vaccine produced in China that is cheap enough, I guess, for the Chinese authorities to include it in, in an EPI. Um, but uh, this is really, in my view, an area that is important. I mean, we at the Gates Foundation are not funding China to do this because China has plenty of money to do it. It's just a question of political will. Um, but that is the problem right now, as you say. China could have introduced uh, vaccines made outside of China, but they have not decided to do that. So it looks, if you look at the total number of kids who are unvaccinated on the planet today, uh, China probably represents more than 50% of unvaccinated kids. Do we still have a question in the back row? Yep, go right ahead. So I'm Srijana from Nepal. So I'm just, uh, I just wanted to share uh, two a slightly different observations than the data that was uh, shared here. So we did an impact assessment study after PCV introduction in Nepal, and which showed like we did not see a herd uh, immunity in uh, older children. So uh, there was a decrease in endpoint pneumonia and IPD in less than two years, but we did not see the change in uh, uh, above two-year-olds. So one reason could be because we had a smaller number of pneumonia and IPD cases in two years and older. That could be one. But if you think there are some other factors that could have uh, affected the herd immunity, though we saw the... What scale, what, what scale did you use? Two plus one. PCV10. PCV10, two plus one. But we did not uh, use the catch-up uh, catch before starting the va uh, vaccine vaccination. It might be one. Yeah. That is one. And another question is, like, uh, even though we saw a significant decrease in PCV10 uh, type uh, serotypes and the pneumonia as well as uh, IPD cases, but among those where we were able to isolate the organism, serotype 1 still remains the most common one. So if you have any PCV to say on 10, that. PCV10 um, has some issues that uh, the clean conjugates do not have. One of these is reduced immuno, immuno, immunogenicity to type 1, but definitely the issue of 19A going up and becoming very dominant. And in pneumonia, especially complicated pneumonia, type 1, type 19A, even 7F, where it's a little bit less good than the other creams. So these are serotypes that selectively cause more pneumonia than, than, than something else. So I think this is one, and definitely if you don't do catch-up, it takes longer to get there, definitely. Also, as a fraction of invasive disease, type 1 becomes more important in the older kids. So it is possible that plays a role. Also, maybe time. You might, you might do better over time. But those are all factors that could be playing a role. So. Time for one last question. Four years post-vaccination. Okay. Yeah, that's... Last question right there. Um, Tan Yui from Thailand. So uh, when you mentioned that because Thailand is uh, not implemented PCV yet. So the question is, because we are not implemented, so the major zero type may be main 13. So do we, so you forecast that in the future there will be different implementation for new country that just introduction that may be 10 or 13 still 
like have a public health impact so, before we have to move to 15 or 20 so, uh, or how it's going to be? You, you know, we don't have to go when you are buying a cell phone. Now, you don't have to start with Model A. Yeah. You buy the last model. There is, in my opinion, there is no reason to start with 10 or 13 if we can start with more serotypes. Okay? They're all cream, anyhow. Okay. And so more serotype would be better to start with, in my opinion. Uh, but uh, I guess in Thailand you didn't start not because you're afraid of serotype, but it because somebody doesn't cost. want to spend the money. Yeah. And of course, they would be more expensive than starting with 10. So it's more like a logistic uh, issue. But I would start, if I can, with a wider spectrum. So I agree with Ron. I mean, obviously better if you can start with 20. But what I will tell you is that there is a much more affordable serotype 10, which includes 19A from, from India. And in my view, if I were recommending, if it is an issue of cost, that that could easily be introduced right now.